My name is Mish. Oh, and I'm Rafe. And we both ran the Emacs Club at the University of Pennsylvania from 2011 to 2013, I think. How do I make this bigger again? Control? Uh, control plus. Sweet. Okay, so we actually have the domain emacsclub.com. What? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> nobody else had a club. <laughs> anyway, we were considered really crazy for starting an Emacs club because, like, who the hell does that? But look, look around you. So um, the way we did it was uh, we ran this website in org mode, right, by publishing to HTML. And uh, the first thing we tried to do was to host the actual server with, with an Emacs instance, which was fun, but uh, not it wasn't robust. Not <laughs> I would have been but, the one sitting there complaining the whole time, this is stupid, why are you trying this? Yeah. But really you can do it. You can host a, a web server in Emacs if you have a server running Emacs. So we just used GitHub to post our published org files after we ran the org publish sequence on the whole directory. So you get something like this, and um, we took meeting notes every time we had a meeting. And I think that was very useful because, um, first of all, you get to have a track record of what you covered in the meeting, so people who start joining the club later can reference what you did before. Um, it's also good for you to know what you've done before. Also, our meetings were very jokey, so um, maybe I can, I can read like an excerpt of our first, very first meeting where we thought we should have like a dot .files club as opposed to an Emacs club. You know, it started out, we need a, we need a way for people to get together and share like aliases or um, config files or, or stuff like that. Um, so if you have a good note taker, you have really good meeting notes like these. I suggest you go through them for a laugh. Uh, when we uh, had our first official meeting and had pizza, the, we had like 50 people in the room Obviously, they came for the pizza, not for the Emacs. But it was good. Um, we did things like we asked people what they wanted to do with Emacs. You know, why were you here? Did you just want to start learning? Were you already an intermediate Emacs user? And, and that sort of gave us fodder for what we should do with the club in the future. Um, and we got a lot of good ideas. Um, something else we did is we kept a list of references to things we did at the, at, the, at the club meetings. So for example, one of our club meetings was an introduction to Emacs. So I wrote this sort of introduction to Emacs for very new beginners who had never used Emacs before. Um, and that's also good to reference if someone's joining the club in the future and they need to learn how to use Emacs. You can just send them this way. Uh, other good things to have references to are if you're doing something specific at your university. So, for example, MATLAB in Emacs is a very specific thing. But, you know, we have a bunch of courses that, are, that teach MATLAB, and you can use Emacs to code in MATLAB. So it's good to have a reference to that just to send people at your university that way um, so, so they know how to set it up. Yeah, and sort of more generally, like, what we would try to do is we would try to identify courses um, where people might benefit from using something like Emacs. So like operating systems, or um, the, the only real example that we executed was uh, CIS 240, which is sort of an intro to systems programming class. Um, so there, take a lot of people who, you know, basically their whole experience is using Eclipse, and now they get into programming in C and uh, assembly language. Uh, so we uh, basically talked to the professor of the course and said, hey, um, we're going to have uh, an Emacs tutorial for your students. And the professor directed all these students to our tutorial. Now, granted, you know, you give somebody an Emacs tutorial and, you know, maybe your retention rate of those people is like 5%, but um, that's, how, that's how you spread the community. And um, ultimately, like, I think the Emacs community is great, not because it's a big community, but because the people who are in the community are really enthusiastic. So Emacs Club was always small. Anytime we would invite people for, you know, uh, every semester, you know, we would have an intro to Emacs and we would try to recruit new people. Usually we would only get one to two, three maybe people each time. But um, we had lots of people who came from nothing, who started with, you know, came into our intro without using Emacs at all and uh, learned a lot. Yeah. And I think as part of that, um, course that was that you could use Emacs to program that systems course. Uh, we got to sit into one of those lectures for half the lecture just to teach people how to use Emacs before they got started. 
So that's another opportunity to sort of get Emacs out there is if you can convince your professor, hey, your students would do a lot better if they knew how to use Emacs in this course. Let us spend half an hour teaching them how to use Emacs in your course. You get a good avenue to show Emacs off. Yeah, so maybe if you're a recent college guy, like, like I just graduated from UPenn uh, this year. Uh, so I will go back for like hackathons for recruiting for my company. Um, maybe you went to like Cal or something, so where you went is local. Um, if you have good relationships with your professors, um, then you can reach out to them and you can get into that classroom even not as a student to teach Emacs to the students. Because I think there are a lot of professors out there who um, they know that what they're providing their students is not, um, is not so applicable to industry. And you know, if you're a professor, if you're an academic, um, you're you know often your exposure to you know what people need to do in the industry is is not very good, right? Because you're sort of in your own little shell. So um, it's good to have. Uh, it's I think a lot of professors really appreciate having people come in um, who um, can give people real world experience because ultimately most of the students in these classrooms are not going to go work in academia. They're going to go work in industry. All right, so I think it's pretty much it. Um, I think having a website is great. I think using Orgwood to keep your website up to date is also great. Um, yeah. Any questions? Is, uh, is MATLAB, MATLAB in Emacs um, the same as Octavo? Because the languages are statistically compatible, right? I don't know. Let's see. Can you repeat the question? Is MATLAB and Emacs the same as Octave mode? Yes. No. So. Um, we, uh, I'm not sure about that, but I know that um, for like our classes, you couldn't use Octave because um, they would rely on like proprietary uh, packages like Console. Oh yeah, Octave um, is like an open source variant of MATLAB, yeah. right? Oct yeah. Octave is the GNU version of okay. MATLAB, um, or it's the version of that language, yeah. right? Um, but it doesn't support okay. all. So is, the Emacs, yeah. is the Emacs part the same? The Emacs part is not the same unless it's also called MATLAB mode because according to this tutorial, which was written by our club a zillion years ago, it was called MATLAB mode. So maybe it's the same. I'm not sure. Uh, yes, I don't, I don't remember who gave this talk. Uh, was probably Nikos. Maybe. A good thing about this is there are authors. I, apparently, I gave this talk. Okay. I don't remember. Memory is not that good. Yeah, we had to use MATLAB, not Octave. This is why you have meeting notes, but maybe you might want to take a lesson from us and uh, take better meeting notes. <laughs> um, spend less time joking around, more time like writing down what's actually happening. Yeah. Any more questions? Yeah. I was thinking maybe you could go to a statistics class and talk about R. Yeah, that's yes. a great idea. So the, the suggestion was to go to a statistics class and talk about using R in Emacs. Um, one thing that we didn't really focus on is targeting Emacs towards non-programmers, but there's actually lots of people who are not programmers per se who could really benefit from using Emacs. Um, for example, physicists. Um, if you write a lot of LaTeX, you may not necessarily be a programmer, but if you're a mathematician, um, you should be using Emacs because it's a good environment for editing LaTeX. Um, I think that there are, uh, it's, it's sort of, it's good for, it's hard for us to think out of, our, out of like the box of being a programmer, but um, it's really cool. Like I have some, like I had some professors in, um, I took classes in like the Wharton School, which is the business school at Penn, and I had like a marketing professor who used Emacs, and he had never written a line of, you know, maybe he'd written lines, you know, code in school, but when he was in school, you know, 30, 40 years ago, he used Emacs on some multi-user, you know, he timeshared Emacs, and he just never got out of the habit of using it. Um, I think the world is not just the tech world, but really the like the academic world is full of people out there who um, still use Emacs. And I think that uh, those are you know people who would be most amenable to letting people come into their classrooms and try to espouse the benefits of Emacs to everybody else. Cool. Other questions or comments in the room? Okay, so I have some things, some comments from um, IRC. Uh, Sasha says that for impressive meeting notes, she uses org timer start and org timer item. Has anyone used these? She uses org dash timer dash start and org dash timer dash item. Yeah, basically. Oh no, it tells you what time you made a note at. 
Yeah. That's like, awesome. Yeah. Oh my god. It's, it's really, really cool. When I used to brew beer, I would keep track of what you did. Oh wow. <laughs> you what? Know, like you know, because then you then you know like how long things are. Yeah. Ready, no, that's how amazing. Long you've been cooking something or like. That would be really. I think that would be really useful also for keeping a. Um, Sorry. Yeah. Um, keeping timestamps like on your work files would be incredibly useful for keeping like an on-call log as well, because um, it would give you some sense like you have some time delta between two commands that you ran, and it'll give you some sense like you know because I've often you know I often run ad hoc SQL queries that are not covered by indices. Like it would be nice to have some loose course documentation of like how long the query is going to take, so I know whether or not I'm going to like pin the server. Yeah. And Sasha says that uh, their rel timestamps relative to the start of the meeting, and you can adjust them all in one go. So I do need to check this out. Org mode timer. Org timer. Yeah, org mode timer. Org mode timer. And org mode timer item. That's a pro yeah. tip. So it's org dash timer dash item. Yeah, yeah. Sweet. Um, Thank you. You can also use org timer like I use it as a Pomodoro technique. So when I start something, it actually pops up after 25 minutes to say. That's awesome. Cool. There's another suggestion. Use org timer for Pomodoro. <laughs> and Ces Diego says they would have gone for pizza as well. So <laughs> well, so there's an interesting story behind that. Um, we um, so it, for a while um, we sort of had uh, we had like a we had exploited our university's um, funding system. So we were not, we were sort of technically affiliated, but not really affiliated with the Dining Philosophers, which was Penn's Computer Science Club. Um, so we didn't really have any funding, but we could sort of pretend that we were part of their club, um, even though it wasn't very general interest. So, uh, and we discovered that um, if you go to the Moore Business Office, which is the business office for our department, um, and you ask for less than $50, they just give you cash. And they don't ask any questions. They uh, do they, they need a receipt? That's about it. Yeah, they just needed a receipt. So, so we just started buying 50 bucks of food yes. once a week and so, getting reimbursed. So we would go to, um, we would go to Potbelly, which is a sandwich place, um, and we would get 10 sandwiches every time, which I believe cost, what, $49.22 or something like that. <laughs> and um, eventually they found, like the dining philosophers found out what we were doing, and they told us, uh, you know, you can get pizza, you can use our budget for pizza if you are doing something general interest, but if it's just the six of you hanging out and uh, <laughs> you know talking about Emacs, um, pay for your own dinner. So there's somewhere in the meeting notes there's a um, there's a note about uh, how you know we you know you can tell exactly the point in time where we had to start bringing our own food, um, and then we just started yeah, ordering something. better food. <laughs> so yeah, if you can if you can find a way to get food into your club meetings, you will get people. Yeah, um, though the signal to noise game. ratio, like if you offer pizza to like college students and you have like wide distribution on that, um, you will end up with, uh, you can get a lot of pizza and um, it doesn't seem like the amount of pizza you get has anything to do with how many people show up or how many people stay after the pizza is served. Um, so another right. suggestion is serve pizza at the end. <laughs> uh, or just the first time and then you yeah. can see who is... They're really interested in email. Our grad students were particularly bad about that, him being one of them. <laughs> yeah, so um, there's a single question from IRC, from Cantor, and they ask um, if there's an introduction, uh, an intro practical class for CS majors at Penn, um, because they introduced an informal one at CMU and it ended up turning into a real class and being required. Yeah, so, so um, there's a, I, I think it's one nine, we, so it, one thing that's cool about um, CS at Penn is that we have these half, so like one credit is like a typical class, you take four or five credits a semester. We would have these half credit um, mini courses and they, mini course is sort of a misnomer because they were usually more than half as much work as a single course. But um, the mini courses would teach like practical things. And, and what was cool about those, and I think that this is not so much possible anymore because the administration has changed a little bit, um, is that these courses were actually taught by student instructors. So um, one of our members taught the Python course, ita for him. Um, and so we had this uh, Unix Linux skills class um, where you would basically, we 
we would teach all students in the class like how to use the shell, how to uh, how to use you know they would have to learn to use Vim or Emacs. They would learn about writing shell scripts using pipes. Um, and then the final project was um, set up your own Linux uh, instance from scratch, um, which is a really cool uh, class, but it would never became required, even though I thought it always should be. Um, so if you ever become like a dean of a computer science department, please make classes like that uh, required <laughs> because you go into, I mean, you know, you go, I'm lucky because I was self-taught before school, but you go into, um, you go into an internship, right, and um, a lot of people are sort of, you know, at a loss for being productive because they just don't understand the tooling. Um, and it would be really nice, and I think it's good for any university to produce, uh, like it's good for a university's reputation to produce better interns, right, who are more ready to work. I think that uh, if you can be known as a university, like I think Waterloo is, known well, is well known for this. Their students uh, have to do a lot of internships, so they get a lot of practical experience and they kick ass as a result. Um, if you can, uh, it's, it's good for the students, it's good for the university, and it's good for the industry too. Yeah. So that's all the questions here. That was an awesome, impromptu talk. Yeah. Thank you.